Hi, and welcome to tonight's episode of ACT TV. No, you're not mistaken. Uh, David Seymour is not on tonight. Uh, I've taken over in the meantime. Uh, and that's because David is still in the house asking the questions of the government that need to be answered. It's been a big day in Parliament, so I'll quickly summarise a few of the issues that we've been talking about today. And we'll start off, firstly, there's been a ministerial statement and urgent debate on last week's terror attack. Now, I won't go into the details. You can see that um, from yesterday's episode where David was joined by Nicole McKee and Dr. James McDowell about the questions ACT has for the government on whether they were actually doing everything that they could to make sure that New Zealanders were safe under our current laws. Because ACT is, the, is one of the only parties that's standing up currently saying, hey, let's take a step back. Let's not get into the position of wanting to rush through a new law. We know what happened last time we did that, and it doesn't end well. Uh, we need to be a bit more responsible, a bit more adult, and actually look at what the government could have been doing better under our current laws. Uh, so let's have a look at the clip from the House today on the questions that David was putting to the Minister on this issue. I want to ask, because I didn't feel we got a clear answer, yes or no, from the Minister in response to Judith Collins' questions. Did any Minister certify the terrorist was a threat or risk to security under Section 1631 of the Immigration Act? And if not, why not? <clears throat> Mr Speaker, I can't confirm whether or not that had happened. What I can be clear about is that um, the agencies who were involved in uh, assessing this individual and uh, keeping tabs on him, uh, both when he was in prison and outside of it, were very clear that he um, uh, met the definition of a terrorist in terms of our terrorism suppression legislation. So secondly, David's been in the House uh, asking two questions of the Prime Minister today, uh, asking those questions that we need uh, answered. And the first was on why was it that two months ago the government decided that travellers coming back into New Zealand through MIQ, if they were leaving New South Wales, didn't need a pre-departure test. And, and this is a question that will be ongoing from the ACT Party because we didn't see uh, an adequate answer coming from the Prime Minister, especially when we know uh, that Delta did come from someone who didn't have one of those pre-departure tests. The second question that David put to the Prime Minister uh, was on saliva testing. Why is it uh, that it's taking so long to get these tests rolled out? Uh, and that other part was also about the vaccine supply issue. Does she actually know how hard it is uh, to get more vaccine supply into New Zealand so everybody has access and opportunity to get the jab if they want it? Let's have another look at a clip of David in the House. Does she stand by her statement from yesterday that, quote, we also want to increase our testing of people who are crossing the Auckland boundaries to ensure we don't see any spread behind, beyond Auckland, end quote. And if so, why hasn't saliva testing been rolled out more widely in Auckland and at, at its boundaries? Mr Speaker, um, yes. Uh, and to answer the second half of the question, uh, as uh, we speak, the Ministry of Health is working on contracting a provider to support border testing with saliva testing. How is it possible that just 800 saliva tests are currently being done each week when the government signed a contract for 20,000 a week all the way back in May. Again, Mr Speaker, keeping in mind that saliva testing that we've contracted to be provided is doing exactly the same job as the nasal swabs, albeit obviously through collecting in a different way. So it's not as if by not having that scaled up that somehow we have lost something. It is an extra additional tool that gives some choice to staff members around the way that they're being tested because we totally understand, and anyone who has been swabbed will know, how uncomfortable it would be to have that done on a regular basis. So is saliva testing a very good thing when the 
government contracts 20,000 saliva tests a week, and not really necessary when it's only doing 800 a week. Mr Speaker, again, if the member wants the uh, intricate details on how the Ministry of Health intends to scale up to what they've contracted to, I invite the member to ask the Minister for COVID-19 response. Does the Prime Minister stand by her statements earlier this afternoon about how difficult and complex it is to negotiate a vaccine swap with another country? Yes, Mr Speaker, I only said it this afternoon and I still mean it. When did she realise it? Mr Speaker, um, again, also, the member wasn't obviously listened to the entire stand-up because this notion of vaccine swaps are still actually sale and purchase agreements individually. Um, we've been working on some of these arrangements over the past couple of weeks. Is the Prime Minister saying they only started to negotiate a swap of vaccines with other countries in the past couple of weeks? Do you remember when the Prime Minister decided that it was a health and safety issue for Parliament to be sitting, so she shut down Parliament? And then nothing really changed. And then all of a sudden, some of that health and safety issue uh, wasn't there anymore because suddenly Parliament's now sitting again. Well, it's really clear because David's in the House tonight uh, passing through what's called the budget which allocates the money that is taken from the government, from you, uh, to be put through a whole range of different initiatives. So David's asking the questions of the education, COVID and finance minister tonight on whether the spending uh, that the government does is adequate and whether it, in fact, could be better. Uh, and there's going to be a whole range of that happening again tomorrow. Um, but we are really concerned uh, about the government's priorities. And one of the issues that we have seen cropping up, even with COVID response, is whether the government's response has been adequate for small businesses who are really struggling uh, with the current lockdowns. And I'm really happy and lucky tonight uh, that I'm joined by Chris Bailey. You all know Chris already. He's our spokesperson for small business. But not only that, he's been a police officer and a teacher for many, many years. Uh, so it gives a really good background to a whole range of issues that we see in New Zealand. Uh, but tonight we're talking about small business. And I know, cover your ears, Auckland, but the rest of our country is moving down to alert level two tonight. Uh, but I wonder, for a range of people who may not have followed what exactly that means for a small business, Walk us through that, Chris. What what are the alert level changes tonight actually really mean? Yeah, thanks, Brooke. Uh, good to be here. Look, there's, there's a lot of confusion over what those uh, they're called Delta level two. It's not just level two. Um, a lot of confusion about what's actually going on and what people are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Some of the things that government has has introduced is a a fifty person maximum in a restaurant. Which, which makes it very difficult for a lot of, a lot of places to, to, um, to make a living, basically. There's single seats, uh, single server um, seating, so there's one person for each table, which means the, the restaurant or the bar has to employ uh, extra people so that they can cater to, to those rules as well. Um, the mask, there's a, a mask. Um, edict that um, that customers must have, except when they're eating or drinking. So, so there's a <laughs> there's confusion out there as to what you're doing in a restaurant or a bar. Um, so I'm not too sure what's going on there. And also, there's a, the mandatory scanning in the QR code, um, which has uh, fallen onto the businesses to monitor and and to make sure that's being done, which I think is very unfair. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of the requirements are being put on small businesses, um, which, which puts a lot of that responsibility on, on a business who's already struggling and wondering, should I even open? Um, and I okay. was, yeah, I was talking to a business um, association today uh, up in Auckland, who's obviously still locked down. Uh, and they're working really hard as a community to make sure that small businesses have the ability, once things reduce, to go into a click and collect service uh, so that some of them can come up and operate. But that's not the case for all businesses, is it, Chris, as these alert levels shift. Not everyone will, will potentially even want to be open. 
Oh, not at all. I've, I've heard, heard also from uh, many businesses who ju have just said it's not worth them opening at all. Click and collect's fine for some places, but but um, not not for a, a bar restaurant uh, type environment. I forgot to mention before that, that there's a spacing rule in there as well. So so not only uh, are there fewer people coming in, there's not not the t um, tables have to be removed so that people aren't sitting close to each other. And many, many businesses are just saying, look, it's just not worth it. Also, the, the wage subsidy is available to, um, to level three and four. And once they hit level two, uh, landlords start to think, um, well, you know, if you're in level two, you're making money so you can pay full rent, whereas it's, mm -hmm. it's just um, often not the case or more, more often than not, not the case. Yeah, so there's a huge issue here with, you know, a lot of those costs that are still ongoing being put on businesses uh, and people might not, with the 50 person limit, actually think that they could still make a profit if they open. What sort of costs will the, will the businesses be weighing up when they're deciding whether or not they should open in these alert levels? Well, just being able to pay their staff is obviously number one, but the, all of those ongoing costs just don't don't go away. The resurgence um, payment was week one, which was, which was great. Uh, didn't cover everything, doesn't cover everything for many businesses, but that was for the first week, and, and we're coming into week four now, and there's been nothing else. All of those costs have continued. Um, the, the power, rent, rates, insurance, all of those things, um, they just don't go away. Um, and, and businesses have to uh, have to somehow magic up some some cash to to, to pay those expenses because the, the, we have a government that just really doesn't understand how difficult it is and the ongoing costs that business owners face. Mm. Yeah, we, we we're both still at home, not able to be in Parliament, but I'm still yeah. been checking my emails and. I saw today that you released a new policy from the ACT Party uh, about this resurgence payment. Yeah. Uh, so you've obviously been busy talking to small business owners, understanding their concerns. So what have you put out about the resurgence payment and how ACT would help small businesses through this time? Yeah, look, look, it's um, we understand that, that these costs are ongoing and the, this resurgence wage subsidy is great. That looks after the employees really well. Um, but we need an ongoing uh, payment to to fix for those other fixed costs because they don't go away, um, and and there's absolutely no money coming in, and it's it's quite difficult. I mean, I was talking to a school teacher the other day, and I said, well, and they said, oh well, you know, suck it up, sort of thing, and um, mm. and uh, I said, well, okay, the schools have been closed, no more money for you, and uh, but it's the same thing. It's uh, there's no money coming in, and, and but yet those are fixed costs are expected to be paid somehow. So we need a, the ongoing resurgence um, payment to, to cover those costs. And, and we just need to stop attacking businesses. Um, there, there's a parent-teacher leave uh, bill going through the house still. Um, we are advocating that we, we love the idea of Matariki, but, but let's swap it with one of the other state holidays and not just put all the costs back onto businesses. And, well, that and, seems pretty fair, to be honest. Well, it makes sense to me. Um, you know, we we uh, businesses just can't afford all these extra all these extra costs that keep on being being thrown at them. Mm. Yes, you're absolutely right. So you've still got uh, the wages that you need to pay for um, this Matariki holiday. So, what what would our proposal be there? Are you are you talking about um, you know taking another holiday away or? Yeah, yeah, yep. and that, that would obviously be in with consultation, um, whether it's our anniversaries or whether it's uh, Labor Day or one of the other stat holidays. If we, uh, if Matariki is 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 important, and it obviously is, then then let's let's treat it, uh, give it the credence it deserves, and and swap it for for one of the others. Also, the minimum wage, we, we need a moratorium on the minimum wage. Uh, businesses need security that they're not just going to keep on being lumbered with these uh, with these extra costs. And um, just putting uh, pulling back, holding off the minimum wage for a certain length, a uh, number of years, um, those productivity, those those employees producing a lot of uh, 
uh, income for the business, they can still get paid more, but but just let's just stop making it compulsory. Mm. No, you're you're absolutely right. There are, there is just every day it seems like businesses take another kick in the guts because of something more coming through government. So you've yeah. got another holiday. You've got this is it this parent teacher leave bill. Um, yeah, you've that's got, a beauty. That is. <laughs> yeah, walk us through that one. <laughs> well, it's it's four hours every. Uh, Every employee is entitled to four hours to attend their uh, their child's um, parent-teacher interview, and um, uh, it just seems now. It's, I've done thousands of parent-teacher interviews in my teaching career, and uh, if if a parent wanted to see their child's teacher, they'd that they'd do it. Um, we already have four weeks holiday a year, annual leave, um, and all the other staff holidays. So, so putting another cost onto businesses with uh, might only seem four hours, but if you've got quite a few staff, um, uh, those those costs add up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like everything you're saying here sounds so sensible. I can't believe it's not already being considered by the government. Just shows you yeah. how wrong their priorities are. Um, yeah. That they're imposing so many things on people who are providing jobs uh, and helping our economy out of these lockdowns. Uh, it's so important that we help these businesses who will actually be the ones uh, who help us through a recovery. And so I, I completely uh, get what you're getting behind with this extra resurgence payment, because without these small businesses, our, our economy would just collapse and where will people go for work? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll get out of COVID um, through small business and their innovation and a and we did it after the lockdown in, in spite of the government, not because of it. Um, but this one's going to be really tough for people. But they, they're going to need it, um, to stop being attacked and, and just give them a, a hand. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, part of what we deliver on ACT TV every night is not only us talking about the issues that matter, but answering your questions. So I see I've got a question here from Scott. Uh, which says, does anyone in Parliament genuinely care about small business? It seems that our government is pushing an agenda that benefits billionaires and globalists at the expense of everyone else. Chris, how would you respond to that? Uh, I certainly care about small business. Yeah, I'm, um, yeah I've been uh, working really hard over the, over the last few weeks to try and... Um, to try and get some uh, common sense in there and, to, and and an understanding of how business works. Uh, well, one thing I, I didn't mention, bro, I think that we've got to consider the mental health, and that is, I know that's your area of, of small business owners, and I they are doing it really tough. And I've heard some some pretty awful stories over the last over the last week about things that are just getting too much for business owners. Yeah, and, and that, that's that harsh reality that the government doesn't seem to take into account mm. of what their law changes, what their regulations, all these added costs actually mean to real people. You know, yeah. behind the, the business front of what your business is called, you're dealing with real humans, real New Zealanders who actually do want to help the economy, want to provide jobs to other New Zealanders, um, but it's just not fair. Uh, to feel like you're constantly being vilified for actually mm. wanting to do a good job. Agree. Yeah. Yeah, completely. I've got a question here from Marcus. He says, why is the government taking so long to roll out the COVID relief funds? I applied in the beginning of level four and still have not been contacted regarding it. Is my business less important because it's in the first year or because I have less staff? What are you hearing from uh, from businesses? Uh, and is this something that is happening to a lot of people or is Marcus just in a really terrible situation and has fallen through the cracks? A new business year. Look, they're, they're the sorts of things you really need to get in touch with the, the um, MSD and and. and I spend an hour on the phone today to them. My situation, you've just got to get the answers from them. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I think the the government can be doing a little bit better on how, yeah. how quickly it, it can roll out these funds. Because I understand in the last lockdown, uh, people didn't have as many complaints about the money coming in. Yeah. Is that right? Well, quite right. Yeah, no, we've lots of complaints about the delays and, and just... Uh, and even even the staff don't seem as friendly when you when you talk to them. 
um, and uh, yeah, payments, slow payments coming out, and and no explanation. So it, this this round does seem a lot more uh, uh, not as easy as the last one. Mm. Do you history. think? Mm. Do you think it was just because the government was caught napping? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They they didn't have a plan. No, they didn't have they didn't have a plan for getting the saliva test. They didn't have a plan oh, for the vaccine, and then it looked like they were going to run out because that were actually doing better than the, before. Um, and now people are not even getting access to their subsidies if they're needing it. So there are just so many holes in the government's priorities, um, and and that's what we're here for to be making sure that they're accountable for what they actually promised. Um, I've got a question here from Mark. Uh, I think this is probably another one for you, Chris. Mm -hmm. My QR code is outside. So how do I check that customers are signing in? Do I take their phones? I think this relates yeah. back to that, um, the, the, the businesses having to take responsibility for everything. So what, what's your mm -hmm. perspective? Yeah, this is an interesting one. I, I, um, I know that last week someone sneaked out of an MIQ um, uh, facility in Auckland and, and went home and, and, and nothing really happened. But if he sneaked into my business and didn't sign in, I'd be responsible. Um, it, it just seems another, another burden on, um, on business owners. But it, it's, look, it's a good question because uh, and, and it's, uh, the expectation is, I think common sense must apply. I spoke to my staff today. I've got a big outdoor area in, in my place. And uh, you, you really have to take customers' word for a lot of it. You, you can't demand to see phones. You can't um, all of that sort of stuff. So, but yeah, the facility, the QR code must be quite visible, and there must be quite a few of them out there, so that there's there's no excuse not to. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think you're kind of spot on there um, with the example of the escapee from MIQ. You know, mm. nobody's been held responsible for that at all. Yeah. But no, that's right. again, you're telling businesses, hey, if you don't display your QR codes correctly, then you're in you're in big trouble. Yeah, well, if, you don't, if you don't enforce scanning, then then you can get in trouble. It, it just seems uh, priorities again. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a question here from Paul, and he asks, can we create a centralizing agency that is a true one-stop shop of small businesses to navigate and clearly understand what a true small business needs to do to comply? Is this just a, um, a, a I guess, a desire for understanding all of the different websites, different places that you need to go Talk me through that, Chris, because you're you're a small business owner. How many different platforms and different ministries do you actually have to deal with? Look, it's um, that, that's a, it's a good point. It's a good question, and it's something that has come up in, in my um, my last six months or, or since getting into Parliament. Really, there there is no real central uh, agency that deals just with with small business. We've got the the Hospitality Association, the Restaurant Association for the, for the those industries. We've got the Retail New Zealand for the, but there's no one that actually coordinates anything at the moment. Um, and lots of really really good good people and and very knowledgeable people out there. But there doesn't seem to be anything that holds them all together so they can they can speak as as one voice. So it's certainly something that um, that that act is is looking at and, and trying to trying to get some sort of uh, semblance of order so that we can all, uh, small businesses, have, have a bigger voice. Yeah, I, I think you're right. There is a need for a bigger voice. And this kind of ties into the next question that I see here on the screen. Um, and it's, it's once again about an interface between small business and government. Um, but he's asking, can there be a serious interface between small business and government that is two-way rather than simply one-way emails about what happens if you don't comply? We see pain points like uh, the Holidays Act and could make recommendations to improve things or simple ways to improve things like the Food Act or whatever it is uh, because we're at the coal face. So I guess the question is, what is the way to engage back with government? Yeah, well, I mean, the the if we look at the parent teacher bill again, the select committee process, and it's 
it's very difficult because uh, uh, consultation doesn't really necessarily mean consultation um, uh, in a lot of areas. So, um, look, I, I absolutely get what um, what the the writer says, but I uh, it, it's it's it is pretty one way at the moment. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Sometimes going through select committee, especially with having the government, the Labour Party having a majority on the committee, it seems like they just want to pass the things through that they want because their government minister told them they needed to do it quickly, rather than actually listening to people at the coal face. Yeah. One thing that I, I can suggest to this person is uh, that's why we exist. Uh, that's why the ACT Party is here, because we are open to suggestions. We're wanting to put forward a policy platform in the 2023 election so that if we form government, we can actually change these laws to make them better for all New Zealanders. Uh, so if you're wanting to engage with us, tell us what you're seeing, what you're hearing, the pain points in your business, um, that's something that we can take on board into another government uh, to make sure that your lives are actually more simple. Uh, so please do get in touch and, you know, join ACT. That's the way of making the change that you actually want to see. Brooke, can I just say, um, if a business is doing well, then then the, the employees are doing, will do well. So, you know, it's in, it's in everyone's uh, advantage, to everyone's advantage, to, to have a business thriving and, and doing well so it can look after its, uh, its people. Mm. Absolutely. I've got one last one here from Jim, who says, the government seems to be holding back with subsidies. Have they run out of money? And what happens when the next outbreak hits? What should I plan for? I think this is a question on, on everybody's mind about, you know, we've had one last year, we've had this lockdown this year. Could we potentially have another one? I think it's it's a very very real possibility, which is why we're asking those important questions about what was the government actually doing over these last 18 months? Uh, because they don't appear to have made any improvements to any of the system uh, to make sure that we didn't need to go into a lockdown. Uh, so we do need to make sure that we're doing better with our vaccines, with our saliva testing, a whole range of different areas. Um, but have they run out of money? Well, they can just keep printing money and they, they can keep piling on debt. And that, that's one of the, the problems. You know, with the COVID relief fund that they had, uh, they've only got about $5 billion left from around $50 billion. Um, and that's because they actually didn't spend a lot of that money wisely. Uh, they spent some of that COVID relief money on things like cameras on fishing boats and the school lunch program. Um, but this is why Parliament is sitting again this week. So we've got the budget and something called the IPRA supply bill. So the government will actually be allocating more money um, for if we need more money. Um, but it's the same thing. What would you suggest, Chris, for a business who, who might be wanting to prepare? How would, how would they go about it? Oh gosh, yeah. Look, I, I'm asking myself the same question. Um, it's that it's that word planning, and 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 that's that is the, the such damaging thing that that is going on at the moment. There is absolutely no certainty. There's no there's no um, right. Okay, we'll get through it through this one, and then we're we're away. But um, I just can't help Jim. I'm afraid because I, we're in the same boat, and and I'd love to know. Yeah, but Jim, we will be advocating for you. Yeah make sure that we've actually got good policies in place so that we don't hopefully need to go into another lockdown because I know how hard it is. And my thoughts are with all the small businesses that are struggling at this time. But this is where we have to sign off because this has gone so fast. It's been wonderful to talk with you, Chris, about small businesses. And hopefully I'll see you here again soon. Uh, this has been wonderful. I look forward to seeing what's on ACT TV tomorrow night. And I hope everybody here signs on and watches again too. Um, and if you're here for wanting an extra, extra for experts, I'm sure Parliament might still be going with David in the house. So head on over and check that out if you've got a few more minutes.